Welcome to Strange Paradigms. In this weekly show, we'll be taking a look into the news and headlines to pick out curious reports of the strange, the weird, and the mysterious. Anything from UFO news to science advancements, the paranormal, and stuff labeled fringe science and fringe phenomena. The topics we cover are fascinating, while some are unnerving and others disturbing, but definitely show that we live in a strange world full of strange mysteries. The idea is for you, the viewers, to be able to offer your thoughts and input on the stories we cover in the live chat. Each news item we go over in the show, I will put all the links to them in the description box below once this live show is over, as well as chapters on the timeline index. Welcome to all my first time viewers and listeners. I hope you find this show informative and that you'll subscribe to this channel and check out my other shows and content. Please make sure to share this video with anyone or groups or forums for those who you think will be interested. The growth of this channel has a lot to do with you, my wonderful viewers and listeners. Thanks for making it to this early show this week. I normally stream at 3 p.m. PST, that's 6 p.m. EST, but this afternoon I have an important lecture to attend on college campus, but we will be back on the regular time next week. For those of you listening to this show on podcast platforms, I want to remind you that if you wish to watch the show instead, as I show many images, the link to this video will be right below in the show description on the podcast. So jump over. I want to say a big hello to those already here in the live chat. And lastly, before we begin, Check out the Discord server. There you will find so many like-minded people as we're still almost at a thousand members and you're going to find a room that's going to suit you perfectly. We have every room that you can imagine. You can share your experiences. or There's an after show chat room as well. There's even a space room. And that is where we're going to start today's show. So scientists find new evidence of liquid water beneath Mars South Pole ice caps in major breakthrough for ongoing search for life. Now, before I continue, I am going to share my screen here to give you a little visual, but my those pictures aren't working. Okay, that's fine. We're just going to continue with this one. So the University of Cambridge led study provides the first independent evidence that uses data other than radar that there's liquid water beneath Mars solar ice cap. Dr. Francis Butcher, second author of the study from the University of Sheffield, said in a statement, this study gives the best indication yet that there is liquid water on Mars today because it means that two of the key pieces of evidence we would look for when searching for subglacial lakes on Earth have now been found on Mars. In order to be liquid at such cold temperatures, the water beneath the South Pole might need to be really salty which would make it difficult for any microbial life to inhabit it. However, it does give hope that there were more habitable environments in the past when the climate was less unforgiving. Interesting. The international research team, which also included scientists from different universities, used spacecraft laser measurements of the shape of the upper surface of the ice cap to identify subtle patterns in its height. Mars has thick ice caps at the bottom at both of its poles, like Earth, which are roughly equivalent in combined volume to the Greenland ice sheet. That is a significant amount of ice or water than most people could even imagine when it comes to Mars. Now, keep in mind, really not too long ago, people and scientists said there is absolutely nothing on Mars. It's a totally dead planet. Nothing can exist. We can never probably inhabit it. There's absolutely no water. And then just recently, honestly, incredibly recent, 
Our thoughts on Mars are beginning to change rather quickly to the point where now it's, in a sense, almost common knowledge that there is that there was water on Mars and that there still might be. And with this article stating that there's a significant amount of ice there goes to show that inhabiting Mars, we can do it. We need to kind of terraform it a little bit, but it's possible because the most important ingredient to creating life is water. And now that we know that it's there, you're going to find humanity on Mars at some point. And we know that Elon Musk is really pushing hard to get people to Mars in 2024. I do believe that we'll be pushed a little bit further um, because we haven't seen too much. Um, what's the word I want to use? We haven't seen too much push for getting people onto Mars by that date. So temperatures on Mars average a bone chilling negative 81 degrees Fahrenheit, but can drop as low as negative 220 degrees Fahrenheit in winter at the poles. The researchers result reported today in the journal Nature Astronomy was actually last week agree with earlier lice ice pertaining radar measurements that were originally interpreted to show a potential area of liquid water beneath the ice. The findings also suggest that magnetic activity occurred relatively recent in the planet's subsurface to enable enhanced geothermal heating needed to keep the water in a liquid state. This is important information. And again, this is becoming more, um, this is becoming more understood amongst people people that are interested when it comes to space, when it comes to Mars. But it is something that we still need to talk about. But we, I think that we usually talk about Mars almost every single show on shifting the paradigm. And I do want to hear some of your thoughts when it comes to this planet. If you were given the opportunity to go and get a ship and land there, would you do it? Would you do it? We talk about Mars on Shifting the Paradigm. We talk about it on Strange Paradigms. We did an entire show on Mysteries with the History. This is a topic that not only I'm interested in, but I think that a lot of us are. Lowlands Pete says, terraforming Mars takes a thousand plus years. Well, the question would be, have we already started? I don't know. I don't know. But it would be rather interesting if that were the case. I mean, we can. I mean, th here's the thing. Can we kick start to the core? It's cold now. Would we be able to do something like that? Do we have the technology to potentially do something like that? There is no protective magnetic fields there. Could we create one? I think so. I think I think it is possible. John aside said, if I could come back, yes. <laughs> I'm with you on that one. But when it comes to the magnetic fields and possibly even to attempt to kick start the core, I don't think we'll be able to do it with today's technology, at least the ones that are publicly available. Sir Gris says, can we take your RV? Only if it's like in Spaceballs. For those that have seen the movie, you know exactly what I'm referencing to, where you have this, this RV that's also able to fly in space. I want one of those. Also, Spaceballs is like one of my favorite movies. It's so funny. I actually watched that movie before watching Star Wars. And then when I watched Star Wars, I was very confused because I'm like, where are the punchlines? Like, am I supposed to laugh right now? And it, it was difficult to go through, but it's an amazing, there, it's an amazing series. I love them all, but I, I shouldn't have started with Spaceballs. <laughs> How many of you have watched it? Seriously, one of the best movies of all time. <laughs> Wellness Sarah says, probably wouldn't risk it, lol. Hey, respect. I know what you mean. Laura, you, you get my joke. Spaceballs is the best. <laughs> Ludicrous speed. 
Um, how does that go? Oh, well, we're, we're not we're not going to quote Spaceballs today, but I know almost the entire movie by heart. So jumping over to our next article, this one, it kind of blew me away because I'm not I'm honestly not too familiar with this topic. And it's about cloning, cloning animals. And just recently, there China cloned a wolf. So a Chinese pet cloning company has announced the birth of the world's first cloned Arctic wolf which was carried to term by an unlikely surrogate mother a beagle so the cloned female wolf pup named maya and her beagle mother were unveiled to the world in a brief video at a press conference held september 19th uh, with a company in beijing according to the chinese news site global times the video was released a hundred days after Maya was born on June 10th in a laboratory in Beijing, according to the representatives in that conference that happened September 19th. So normally, this Beijing company specializes in cloning dead pets, such as cats, dogs, and horses for private clients. But the company now wants to use its expertise to help clone endangered species for conservation purposes. So Maya was cloned using DNA collected from a fully grown Arctic wolf, also called Maya, that died in captivity in a wildlife park in northeastern China. The original Maya, who was born in Canada before being shipped to China in 2006, died due to old age in early 2021. So the cloning of Maya was significantly completed after two years of painstaking efforts. And if you look at this wolf, it is adorable. This thing is so, so cute. <laughs> this cloning company... Their researchers originally created 137 Arctic wolf embryos by fusing skin cells from the original Maya with immature egg cells from dogs using a process known as somatic cell nuclear transfer, also known as SCNT. And of those embryos, 85 were successfully transplanted into seven beagle um, surrogates. So from those transplanted embryos, just one fully developed during pregnancy, which is this one right here, Maya 2.0. This is her as a little pup, super cute. And then here it is today. Not that one, but this one. The researchers used the beagle because they were not there were not enough female wolves in captivity for the scientists' experiments. Luckily, dogs share enough DNA with wolves for the hybrid pregnancy to to become successful. Now, the main benefits of cloning endangered species is that it maintains the amount of genetic diversity within a species. That was news to me. So if the clones can reproduce with other non-cloned individuals, this gives threatened species a fighting chance to adapt to the selection pressures that are driving them towards extinction. So I went ahead and did a little bit of extra research on the whole process of cloning. When did it start? And really what what's what's going on all behind it is it ethical and turns out that dolly the sheep in 1996 was the first clone that was publicly revealed for those that have been following this topic how many of you remember dolly the sheep when it came out in 1996 once again this was news to me i have not followed this topic so i was like oh that was kind of recent. I could have imagined it to go a little further back, honestly, but 1996 is a decent year. 
So to make a clone, scientists transfer the DNA from an animal's somatic cell into an egg cell that has had its nucleus and DNA removed. The egg develops into an embryo that contains the same genes as the cell donor. Then the embryo is implanted into an adult female uterus to grow. I know I'm not the only one here, but from watching so much television as a kid and even today, I really thought, and I again, I know I'm not the only one, I really thought that cloning meant that you were created in a test tube, not actually in a uterus of another animal that shares similar DNA. So when I was reading this, I'm like, wow, I need to catch up on a lot of this to attempt to understand what the heck is going on here. because. I, I watched too many sci-fi movies, and I really thought that they were created in test tubes. Bio.org says, Cloning allows farmers and ranchers to accelerate the reproduction of their most productive livestock in order to better produce safe and healthy food. Cloning reproduces the healthiest animals, thus minimizing the use of antibiotics, growth hormones, and other chemicals. That information was rather interesting. Again, that came from bio.org. And it makes me question, does that mean that it's ethical when they're, when they're able to create healthier foods, when they're able to do things of this nature where you're not dealing with growth hormones and other chemicals? Is that the case for everything? That is where my question lies. But what about you? Sever says, also great for restoring ecosystems. Definitely. And I think now more than ever, to my under, from, from my limited understanding, I think we're going to see a lot more cloning in the near future where there seems to be more and more animals that are being endangered. And even, and even plant species as well. Crispus, I didn't know this. Most mass-produced beef comes from cloned animals. I learn something from you guys every single show. So I really love the fact that so many of you are interactive in the live chat because I'm able to, to continue doing the research on these topics. So I will look into that and I, I will check that out because that is news to me. So thank you. And that's what this show is all about. This show is about getting you involved to share your thoughts and your input in the articles that we cover today and every single Friday on Strange Paradigms. So that, that was one article that really sparked my imagination and it's it's going to continue after today's show to do more research but there was something that i found on the news that i'm like you can travel from london to new york in 80 minutes is that even possible the answer is yes theoretically at least i'm going to share my screen here See how many of you are familiar with this article that was just recently released, blew my mind, of this supersonic plane. And it's believed, once again, theoretically, that you're able to travel from London to New York in 80 minutes at a speed of about 2,400 miles per hour. And now I went ahead and I Googled and I said, on average, how long does it take to get from New York to London on a regular conventional airplane? Takes eight hours. So cutting that to 80 minutes? Dude, <laughs> that is wild. So hypersonic commercial flight isn't anything new because, of course, Concorde operated for many years. And we're going to get into that for those that are not familiar with 
that plane. But first, let's talk about the one that's on the screen here. And this plane that we're looking at is called Hyper Sting, is a concept plane that could whiz passengers from London to New York City in just 80 minutes in the near future. The plane would travel at a speed of about 2,400 miles per hour, twice as fast as the Concorde plane, measuring 328 feet long with a 168 foot wingspan. So the aircraft is also nearly twice its size as the Concorde. So we have Spanish designer Oscar Pinales who is behind the mock-ups, saying 170 passengers could enjoy travel aboard the Hyper Sting. He states, Concorde was a brilliant piece of machinery, a noble experiment, but it put too much emissions in the environment, too much noise into our communities, and was too expensive to operate. A new era of supersonic flight might be just around the corner, but there are challenges to overcome when it comes to flying faster than the speed of sound. Today, there are some projects for a new era of supersonic flight from different private and public initiatives. Some of those are well underway and could become, in a few years, a real concept. There's another photo of Hyper Sting. And Hyper Sting would be powered to incredible speeds by two ramjet engines, which would be fueled by a small nuclear reactor. And it would also require the use of, so far, theoretical cold fusion nuclear reactor. Interesting. Here. I would like to mention that what I had just said a little while ago, I was quoting directly from Oscar when he was when he had given an interview on his mock-ups on this craft. So there have there has not been a commercial supersonic airline since the last Concorde was which retired in 2003 after 27 years in service. So what what is Concorde? And I'll be honest with you, I had no idea that we previously had supersonic airplanes in the early 2000s. Okay, I was like, what? And I'm also aware I'm not the only one. I'm going to share my screen here of how it looks. And if you can tell, it looks rather similar to the new airplane that we're talking about today. So the Concorde was a revolutionary British and French design. This is a supersonic commercial jet, just as the, the hypersonic will be in the near future. But this was ultimately killed off by high cost tickets, low passenger numbers, noise and safety concerns. The result was a technological masterpiece, the Delta Wing Concorde, which made its first flight. Listen to this. It made its first flight on March 2nd, 1969. The Concorde had a maximum cruising speed of 2,000 kilometers per hour, being about 1,300 miles per hour, or Mach 2.04, more than twice the speed of sound, allowing the aircraft to reduce the flight time between London and New York to about three hours, which is still incredibly significant. And again, the first launch was in 1969. And yet here we are today, and we're still just kind of gassing our way through it and we're still using conventional airplanes where it takes us eight hours to get from new york city to london i'm a bit disappointed i'm not gonna lie with you the development costs of the concorde was so great that they could they could have never recovered from operations so the aircraft was never financially profitable have you heard of this supersonic commercial jet before? Because 
it was news to me. And I kind of want to go on one. Just to like ninja fly from one place to another. I'd be in. Why, why stress out with taking forever to fly from one place to another? I already stress enough when I go to airports. I'm always there like a good three or four hours early just to be safe with the lines and like the baggage check-in and all of that nonsense. And then like flying my, finding my gate. I'm always three hours or four hours early because I never want to miss my airplane. Happened once and that was very traumatic. <laughs> Thank you so much. I deeply appreciate the super chat, Micaela, which is a beautiful name, by the way. I think it's like a part of a song that I know, but thank you. I really do appreciate that. And now I'm never going to forget that name. <laughs> Hyde says, Mach 2 is slower than almost all pistol bullets. I didn't know that. Thank you for sharing that information. Okay. So one thing, while this previous article might be incredibly fascinating, one thing that I've mentioned a good amount of time, so for those that are my um, average listeners know that I'm mortified of cockroaches. Like they are the scariest bug for me on the planet, even though they don't bite, they don't sting, they don't, they're not like evil or anything. They're just really grody. And so for my regular listeners, you are aware that I'm just not for it. And so I found something that I would invest in if it wasn't so dangerous. And that is using a laser to kill bugs. Here is a picture of that. And I'm going to share another picture a little bit later. So the study released by a research associate at Harriet Watt University, which was conducted last year, but published just recently, used a laser insect control device automated with machine vision to perform a series of experiments on cockroaches. They were able to not only detect cockroaches at high accuracy, but also neutralize the individual insects at a distance of up to 1.2 meters. Now, in this paper, when it says neutralize, it means to kill them. The researcher Rachmat Ulin said, I started using a Jetson Nano that allowed me to use deep learning technologies with higher accuracy to detect an object. The Jetson Nano is a small computer that can run machine learning algorithms. The computer processes a digital signal from two cameras to determine the cockroach's position. It transmits that information to a machine that measures electric current, which changes the direction of the laser to shoot the target. This is very cool. According to the paper, he tried his configuration at different power levels for the laser, and at a lower power level, he found that he could influence the behavior of roaches by simply triggering their flight response with the laser. This way, they could potentially be trained to not shelter in a particular dark area. At a higher power level, the cockroaches were effectively neutralized, which once again, the paper in the paper's language, means to kill. He also made all of his data and instructions freely available, noting that others can try as long as they take proper precautions stating, I use very cheap hardware and cheap technology, and it's open source. All sources are uploaded in my GitHub and see how to do it and how to use it. He mentioned that others have already started trying it out with other pests like hornets, which makes sense. So if it can damage cockroaches, it can also damage other pests in agriculture. 
he mentions in the paper notes that all the devices cost no more than about $250. That being said, although the prototype is suitable for academic research, there's a lot more to be done before it can be deployed on a longer, on a larger scale. For example, the paper notes that a smaller laser point would be more effective at killing the roaches, but is difficult to implement experimentally. The ability to precisely control which part of a cockroach's body were hit would also be helpful, the paper says. It's um, also sadly, but not quite ready for household use at least not yet. And it's not recommended because it's a little dangerous. Lasers can damage not only cockroaches, but also your eyes. Either way, I think I would try this out if I was out and about, if I had my own lab. I think that would be super cool. Here's another image directly from the paper. But I think that it's really amazing to have a scientist to make his notes and the devices that he used publicly available for anyone to use and to implement. And I will say that is rather rare from the white papers that I've read, the amount of research that I have done for these shows. That information usually, usually is not available to the public for literally anyone to grab and to use. So I think that's pretty awesome of him to make this information public. Now, I would like to mention, while I do joke with you that I really don't like cockroaches, which I don't, and that I would probably shoot them. I, I honestly wouldn't. If, if the real event came... I would attempt to like scoop it up in a cup and like throw it outside, mainly because I'm a Buddhist and I respect all life, even though I cockroaches are the only things I really don't like. I, I still don't have the nerve to truly attempt to kill them. The same goes for spiders and mosquitoes and things like this. When they do come in the house, I really try to scoop them up and put them outside the best I can. But I, I do really make sure to prevent bugs even coming into the house because I just don't like catching them to begin with. It's not my cup of tea. And I do really like tea, especially English breakfast tea. But right now I'm drinking some, some coffee. Because this, this is an early show. But for, for you in the live chat... If you were to encounter a cockroach, what would you do with it? Or any kind of bug that you really don't like? Would you run the other way in a different corner? Would you attempt to catch it? Or would you tell someone being like, hey, you need to get your shoe and hit this thing? Because I, I think it kind of just depends on the bug. It depends on on what you fear, but also depends if you live alone, right? It's very easy to tell someone else to do it than for you to do it. What? Steve says in Australia the state the state of South New South Wales mascot is a cockroach. Do you see this face? Mm. That's a bit spooky for me. So I'm going to make a poll right now on cockroaches or insect phobias and please answer the poll so we can go ahead and look at the final results when the poll is over. So I'm going to go ahead and make that now. Polyhedral says, I mean, roaches are my one exception to the no kill rule that I have. I, I will tell you a story while I make this poll because I can do both at the same time. I used to have this cat and when I had just adopted him, I was still living at my dad's house. It's like this is in high school. And he loved playing with bugs. Like he loved playing with bugs to the point where he would torture them. And th this one night, he brings a cockroach into my room and he drops it on my face while it's still alive. It crawled on my face. This is like, like at 2 a.m. I panicked, obviously. And I did not sleep the rest of the night. And since then, since that exact moment, 
I think I was about 17 or 18. I've always had this huge fear of cockroaches because they crawled on my face once because of my cat. Yeah. For those that want to see a picture of my cat, he's on my Instagram. And like the, one of the very, very first photos I posted on my Instagram. And he is no longer with me. And I, I don't have I don't have the heart to have another cat. But I love cats with all of with my entire heart. And instead of having cats, I just feed the like outside cats with treats and tuna and all that fun stuff. So I don't have to have that intense relationship. And they can just kind of come whenever they want. But that is my story on why I have such a phobia of cockroaches. So here in the poll, it says, which insect makes you want to yell and run? Is it cockroaches, spiders, fruit flies, or mosquitoes? <laughs> you obviously know which one I picked out of all of those. Unfortunately, I actually can't go on my own polls and answer, but you can. So please let me know out of all those bugs, which one? So, so far, cockroaches and spiders are both 42%. I don't blame you. Spiders are a little spooky. But for those that caught my YouTube short or the TikTok of this of this one spider, it was the cutest thing because it looked like someone's grandfather who had like little spectacles and a little mustache. If you haven't seen it, jump over to my YouTube shorts and you will see it. And then you'll see a comparison of a guy that looks very similar to this spider, like an elderly, wise looking spider. Very funny. If I were to see that one, I wouldn't be as scared. <laughs> Grandpa, is that you? That's what I would probably be saying. Jessica says, I hate spiders. Hmm. Yeah. Um. Jose says, fruit flies. I keep spiders around just to help me get them. That's smart. Lowlands Pete says, roaches are good to rate the restaurant. Ay, Dios mío. No, thank you. If I were to see a cockroach in a restaurant, I'm bolting out the door. Forget it. Because then I can imagine how their kitchen looks. I've watched Hell's Kitchen from Gordon Ramsay. And sometimes those kitchens are so disgusting. I'm thinking, it's okay. I'll just cook at home. It's fine. For those that are still answering those, that poll, consistently... Um, I really like talking about puck wedgies, which are little goblins, but those ones in particular are from the Bridgewater Triangle in Massachusetts. And ever since then, that name, puck wedgie, it just sounds so cute and it doesn't actually match the characteristics of a goblin at all. It just sounds adorable. Well, there is a type of puck wedgie again, a type of goblin, in Paraguay. And I'm going to share my screen here of a video, and then I'm going to go ahead and read the article to you because it, it's rather bizarre. So let's go ahead and share the screen. Here it is. And just really focus on this area right here. The quality isn't great, but you see this kind of weird thing running. And I'm going to back that up one more time. So you have a policeman in Paraguay. He's following what he believes to be a type of puckwedgie type of goblin. And it kind of goes up and then it goes on all fours and it starts running. Well, the policeman attempts to shoot at it. He's so terrified. He does not think it's a person that he attempts to shoot. And then you have another policeman, to my understanding, that is filming this right now. I'm going to share it one more time because it is rather fast. As you can tell in the audio, he shoots right out the window. And you could see like how like a little tail or something. This, you saw the little sh shot. There is no audio. So that's why I'm kind of voicing it over for you. Because sometimes StreamYard just doesn't like audio. And we're just going to have to work with that. To watch the full video for all of these articles that I covered, the link will be below once this live show is over. So you're able to watch it a little bit closer, able to zoom in and see what you think this may be. But... What we are looking at is authorities in Paraguay were forced forced to set the record straight about a very strange video 
purportedly showing a cop encountering a legendary goblin-like entity that went viral on social media in the country just last week. So the footage isn't that clear, but you can check it out for yourself after the show and then listen back to what I'm saying about this article. So according to a local media report, a bizarre footage appeared online this past Monday, and it was allegedly captured by a witness who watched the weirdness unfold on Friday evening in Paraguay. In the video, a cop stands outside of a building with his gun drawn and shouts at what appears to be a rather unusual intruder. The mysterious stranger seems to be small, bipedal, and capable of scaling the front door with ease before running out of sight while the police officer shoots at a window while in pursuit. Many social media users in Paraguay quickly concluded that the cop had, in fact, encountered a legendary entity known as the Pombero, which is a goblin-like creature that is infamous in the country as something of a mischievous trickster-like figure, which is consistent across the globe. These goblin-like entities are consistently mischievous, they're tricksters, they're a little bit evil at times, but they're not in the sense too dangerous that is why i kind of brought up this article because it was just so weird locals are afraid of the pombero there but it is also known as an urban legend across the country this is a well-known legend so could you imagine being a cop and having potentially having those exact same thoughts? Is this a legendary goblin? Like, do I shoot at it? It's definitely not a person. This is a trespassing entity. Do I shoot it? Do I bring it to the lab? What do I do? Well, we are aware that this thing scurried off and left. And now people are attempting to debunk this, saying that it was just a run-of-the-mill robber who was acting strangely because they were under the influence of drugs. Now, there is no evidence of that. This creature, this person, has never been captured, never been interviewed. So it's just merely an assumption. And based off of that video that I showed, which once again, you will have access to it, it is really hard to say what it is, but it is strange, and we are on strange paradigms. Therefore, we are covering it. Pretty weird. And you know how much I love puck wedgies. <laughs> I do. And I think that I'm probably going to call my research motorhome the puck wedgie. I, I think, or I there was one comment that I read, I think it was a few days ago or last week, the ramen wagon. That one's also pretty funny. So I think at some point, as soon as I purchase the motorhome, I'm going to put a poll up on social media and ask you what you think you should name it. And then I'll put a poll up. And then the one that has like the most, um, the most likes, probably call it that at some point. But I'm thinking a little bit too ahead of myself. But the pug is super cute and the ramen wagon is also kind of awesome. I'm really excited for this. I'm not lying. I think about it every day. But from that video and from the article that I had just mentioned of a policeman shooting a weird type of entity in Paraguay, what do you think about this? Do you think that it's weird? Do you think it really was just a person or something else? John says, cool video, though. Jose says, I hate gnomes. Yeah, gnomes are a bit freaky. Also, leprechauns. After watching the movie Leprechaun, I'm not too fond of those. <laughs> so on the poll, spiders won. What is one insect that would make you yell and run? The majority of you said spiders. Spiders are freaky. Now imagine a, a human-sized spider. I would... I'd probably faint from fear. I probably would. Ooh, we are going through these, which is awesome. I will say that I do daydream about life on, on other worlds, and I wonder about massive insect life. <laughs> Or like on, on worlds with less gravity. 
And I'm thinking if I was on a spaceship and I happened to land on a world that looks super habitable, I, I put my ship on there, I get off and I see these ginormous bugs, like my size or taller, take any insect. Insect faces are scary. Do not tell me otherwise. People think butterflies are beautiful. Have you ever seen their face? They're not. They are very scary. So imagine any kind of insect that comes to mind a hundred times bigger or even on our planet, right? Like for instance, these, for instance, dinosaurs, they were huge. They were scary. Now we have these cute little lizards. We get some cute little snakes. You know, we get like decent things, small chickens as well. But imagine those in a huge size. It makes me question, what kind of life is out there? We think that everything here on this planet is pretty small, but huge bugs? I'll pass. Thank you. And then you just get eaten by one. So while you think about that, some of the thoughts that I have, that can be rather scary. Let's jump over into another scary story about a woman who believes she's being haunted by a black witch type of entity. I'm going to share my screen here just as a visual aid. This is not a real picture that she captured, but it is just a picture for you to look at. Okay. So 33-year-old April Brown was struggling through such a hard time in life that spotted mysterious lights and mirrors dotted around her home because it became too much for her health to handle. She believes a black witch keeps appearing in mirrors, forcing her to move out of her house. She said eight months of chilling hauntings in her Wausau West Midlands flat was enough for her to pack up her bags and move out. She said in an interview, they were coming through the mirror. Every time I went to take a photograph, a spirit or whatever you want to call it was appearing in the mirror every single time. And it was just not, it was just not appearing in one mirror either. According to April, mysterious shapes would appear in a variety of reflective surfaces, including spoons and even her TV screen. She mentioned, I've got a photograph where a shadow is bending behind me with her eyes and another photo, which looks to be a 50 foot bug coming through the mirror. Pretty freaky. Now, she did mention that, and this is to Daily Star, she did mention that she captured a lot of photos. However, she did not release any of them to the, to the people that were interviewing her, which is rather disappointing. However, keen to get a second opinion, April sought the expertise of paranormal investigators to scan over some of her photos and even welcomed a minister from a church to enter her home. It's pretty freaky. And she, and she stated, I ended up stop taking photos and I, I've also had experts take a look at one of my mirror photos to, and to say that it was a black witch. Once again, these pictures were not released to the Daily Star, which is a little bit suspicious. However, it is still a rather spooky story and we are in the spooky season, so we are going to cover this. So according to online definitions, a black witch practices magic for the purpose of evil and specializes in the destruction of human life. Well, it turns out during her time living in this apartment, she attempted to commit suicide and she had to go to the hospital to get help from that, along with she did have her family to attempt and support her. After this, she moved out. She was like, no, I cannot handle this anymore. This is scaring me a little bit too much. She moves out. She gets a new apartment. And guess what? This ghost allegedly followed her into the next apartment. Now, here is the interesting thing about this story. She had mentioned when she began to see this black witch once again through the mirrors, through the spoons, through the television, 
she laughed at it. She's like, you know what? I'm so much stronger now. And if anything, I want to understand the spirit world now more than ever. And so now she had mentioned that she started doing tarot tarot card reading tarot card readings and to attempt to understand more about the spirit world so if we believe this story or not it goes to show that in her case she was able to bring to take a very negative experience and to make it somewhat positive hope and glory says that's a pick of my ex-wife my ex in the morning lol <laughs> that's funny uh, and and that is me first thing in the morning as well because yeah Austin says she must not recognize her own reflection at some times. Oh, that is funny. That is funny and terrible. Christina, have you covered the Australian Mimi lights? I have not, but I will look into it. That sounds interesting. Mimi, very cute name. I will look at it. But when it comes to this article, what are your thoughts on it? Once again, and I mentioned this twice already, those pictures that she allegedly took were not released. But either way, it is a rather intense story. And ones that we've covered previously, where you have these types of dark type entities that influence the person to be depressed, to have anxiety, to commit suicide. The same thing goes for allegedly some shadow people as well. Uh, people that encounter shadow people where they're able to have these intense negative emotions. Lowlands Pete says, looks like a Japanese horror movie. Oh, yeah. Japanese horror is unique for sure. So, yes, it does look like a ghost from a Japanese ghost movie. And this picture I just pulled off the Internet just as a visual aid while I covered this story. And for those listening to this on a podcast platform, jump over to YouTube so you're able to see the pictures that I am sharing as well. Definitely, Eric. The ring. For sure. Spooky. Okay, I'm going to take this down. What I do find... Um, interesting about this is that once again and i keep saying once again consistently but she was able to bring a, a very negative experience into a positive one she was able to, to, to take care of it well this next one i guess maybe as ancient aliens might say this information was given to them by ancient astronauts of some kind and this one is really cool and just recently released. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Of It'll make more sense when I go over the article. But here we're looking at a picture and you're like, what the heck is this? Well, ancient paintings previously thought to have been prehistoric animal symbols are ancient star maps. Experts have recently revealed. Early cave art shows that people had advanced knowledge of the night sky within the last ice age. But intellectually, they were hardly any different to us today. The study revealed that humans had a sophisticated knowledge of stars and constellations more than 40,000 years ago. Here in this photo, these animal symbols represent star constellations in the night sky. Scientists have revealed that ancient humans kept track of time by observing how stars, stars change their position in the sky. And as previously thought, the ancient work of art found in many places throughout Europe are not simply representations of wild animals. Instead, animal symbols represent constellations of stars in the night sky. They represent dates, marking events such as asteroid strikes, explains, and this is explained by a new study published by the University of Edinburgh. I would like to mention that all of the links will go into the description box below the video window about five minutes after the show finishes. So you'll be able to catch all of the articles that we cover today. 
Scientists suggest that ancient people perfectly understood the effect caused by the gradual change of the axis of Earth's rotation. The discovery of this phenomenon, called precision of the equinoxes, were previously credited to the ancient Greeks. Early cave art shows that people had advanced knowledge of the night sky within the last ice age. I just said that. But intellectually, they were hardly any different to us today. This is fascinating information and something that definitely ancient aliens would be all over. But it goes to show that even 40,000 years ago, which is an extensive amount of time, the people had this had this intense precision to attempt of understanding what is going on. This, this, this intense precision. Amazing. Truly amazing. And it makes you question to look back at cave paintings and think, are they just depicting wild animals? Or are they predicting, predicting star constellations? Unbelievable. Jose says aliens. Here is one more photo that I do have shared for you. It's very cool. It, it really does make you look back at all the previous cave paintings. It makes you think outside of the box. What were they really trying to, to convey? Was it just wild animals or was something more than that? Sometimes things are not as simple as they are perceived to be. Sometimes they definitely are super simplistic. It, you got to find that, that line between the two. Okay, Jumping over to our next one, still relating to more ancient civilizations. But I'm trying, here it is. This one, that was a little bit odd. There we go. Here's a skeleton with only its spine. But if you take a closer look, there is a piece of wood that is going through the spinal column. What does that mean? What is going on here? I'm about to tell you. Charles, thank you. It says, hope all is well. Just catching your live stream on lunch. Thank you for joining us on your lunch break. Hope you're enjoying these articles that we're covering today. Everything that is strange and bizarre, you can find right here on Strange Paradigms every single week. And I'm so happy that so many of you came early to today's show as it has been pushed a good few hours ahead of time, ahead of schedule. So hundreds of years ago, indigenous people in coastal Peru may have collected the scattered remains of their dead from desecrated graves and threaded reed posts through the spinal bones. Scientists recently counted nearly 200 of these bone threaded posts in stone tombs in Peru, and they suspect that the practice arose as a means of reassembling remains after the Spanish had looted and desecrated indigenous graves. Jessica, thank you for the RV fund. Thank you very much. Archaeologists investigated 664 graves and a 15 square mile zone that contained 44 burial sites. They documented 192 examples of posts threaded 
with vertebrae. The researchers then measured the amount of radioactive carbon in the bones and read posts. Radioactive carbon accumulates when an organism is alive but decays to nitrogen as a constant rate once the organism is dead. So based on the amount of this carbon, the scientists could estimate when the posts were assembled. And their analysis placed the vertebrae and posts between 450 to 650 AD. Sorry, 1450 to 1650 AD, a time when the Inca Empire was crumbling and European colonizers were coming in. So you had lead researcher and study author Jacob Bongers, a senior research associate um, at the University of the United Kingdom. And he had stated that this was a period of upheaval and crisis in which indigenous tombs were frequently desecrated by the Spanish and the Chinca people may have revisited looted tombs and threaded spine bones, spinal bones on reeds in order to reconstruct disrupted burials. So the Chinca kingdom once had a population numbering about 30,000 people, and it thrived around 1,000 to 1,400 AD, eventually merging with the Inca Empire toward the end of the 15th century. But after the Europeans arrived and brought famines and epidemics, the Chinca numbers plummeted to about 970 people in 1583, according to the study. That's significant. Here's another photo of multiple spines on reeds, which is pretty spooky. Steve, thank you. It says ramen name. Boo, woo, woo, woo. <laughs> thank you for that. Thank you for the super chat. I really appreciate that. <laughs> So most posts held bones belonging to a single individual, but the spines were incomplete, with most of the bones disconnected and out of order. This suggested that the threading was not performed as a part of the original burial. Rather, someone gathered and threaded the spinal vertebrae after the bodies had decomposed, which would be smart. I don't think I would be... I, I wouldn't, and I wouldn't want other people to, like, pull out people's, you know, vertebrae while they still have flesh and meat on them. That's kind of grody. So the fact that they did that way after was probably pretty smart. Hyde says, 100 likes, keep black witches away. Oh, yes. Yeah. So it really does help with the crazy YouTube algorithm to get to 100 likes for this video. So if you are enjoying the content if you're enjoying today's live show please make sure to hit the like button before you head out but actually do it right now do it right now it really helps thank you when i was looking at this article i found it a little bit odd because i was thinking at what time did they place all of these spines on reeds? And I kind of thought of it more as a sense of um, to to entice fear in other in other tribes around the area. But turns out it was more of a matter of respect after these graves had been looted, had been totally just trashed. The 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 tribe said, no, we, we want to respect our dead. We want them to live a happy afterlife, but their body needs to be safe. So let's attempt and at least get their vertebrae and put it on a reed and let them feel respected once again. So I'm really happy that this article in particular went into detail on that because when I read the title, I had a lot of questions already thinking, what's going on here? What is this for? But they answered that. So I'm very grateful. <laughs> Polyhedral says, hard to thread when still alive. Pretty brutal type of torture, if you'd ask me.
So we are jumping from past over to the present, and the U.S. agency adapts new space junk rules to reduce the space junk risks. Keith, thank you so much for the super sticker. Thank you. Stingray, welcome. Welcome. You are new here to the community and watching the live show. You just subscribed. Thank you so much. And everyone, please make sure to make Stingray feel at home and give him a give him a big hello. While you do that, I'm going to share my screen here just as a visual of some space junk going on and what is now being done about it. So this was just released yesterday, and the U.S. Federal Communications Commission voted four out of zero Thursday to adopt new rules to address growing risks of orbitable debris, orbitable debris to space exploration by shrinking the time to remove defunct satellites. The FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, voted to require post-mission disposal of low Earth orbit satellites within five years. The agency previously recommended operators of satellites in low Earth orbit ensure spacecraft re-entry Earth's atmosphere within 25 years. The FCC chair, Jessica Rosenworcel, said it will mean more accountability and less risk of collisions that increase orbital, orbitable debris and the likelihood of space communication failures. The U.S. Telecommunications regulator noted that of 10,000 satellites deployed since 1957, more than half are no longer working. The FCC said defunct satellites, discarded rocket cores, and other debris now fill the space environment, creating challenges for current and future missions, noting there are more than 4,800 satellites operating in orbit at the end of last year, and the mass majority of those are commercial low-Earth orbit satellites. The second space age is here. For it to continue to grow, we need to do more to clean up after ourselves so space innovation can continue to respond. Without a safe operating environment, debris risks could escalate from a financial afterthought to a hazard that makes investors think twice and could complicate operations in a way that slows or limits new space endeavors while driving up permission costs. This is important, and this is the conversation that we do need to have, especially for those that are interested when it comes to space exploration or even the UFO phenomenon as well. It is so important that our skies and just outside of our Earth's atmosphere is clean to attempt and do better and more efficient space exploration because you could launch a long, launch a long, launch launch a rocket and you could end up hitting some of this space debris and that'll be incredibly damaging to everything so it is good that they are placing new laws so that we can be more efficient when we explore space something else that is rather recent is robo dogs Okay. How many of you like dogs? How many of you have a dog? What is it that you like about them? Do you like to go on walks with them? Do you like that feeling that they give you when they kind of nudge their head, when they put their paw on your leg and they kind of love on you? Do you enjoy feeding them, for instance? What is it about dogs that you love and why, and why you may have one? Oh, uh, Skyhawk, I would like to mention, check your email inbox, please, when you get a chance. So what is it about dogs that you like? 
Well, robot dogs can be taught to mimic the behaviors of our real best friends, like nudging with the paw or looking back at the owner on walks to make them more lovable. Robot dogs could be taught our favorite canine corks in order to make them more realistic and more lovable. Researchers at the University of Glasgow um, have identified seven categories of dog behaviors that owners perceive as important for bonding with their pets. This include physical touch and enthusiasm, with examples like resting their head on their master and giving them kisses when they come home. Neuroscientist Professor Emily Cross said, We know that humans and pet connections have great benefits. Knowing that qualities lead to this positive outcome could help with the development of robots that could also portray these qualities. Understanding the reasons why human find why humans find four-legged dogs to be so lovable, it would help to create the perfect robot dog without having to feed them, you know, clean up after them, and maybe possibly even be more efficient if they are service dogs. Robots that exhibit social behaviors have been proposed as a potential solution to loneliness and as an assistant to help the elderly. However, there are challenges in programming all the nuances of humanity to create a convincing humanoid bot, just like these people, robots as well. So as an alternative, some researchers are exploring the possibility of developing God in dog inspired robots that can form similar bonds with people. To gain insight into these bonds and what plays a hand in forming them, Professor Cross and colleagues surveyed 153 dog owners and they said, What is it about dogs that you love? And that's how I opened this article for you. What is it about dogs that you just love about them? And so she asked this exact same question. And after having 153 people do a survey, she came up with several categories, specifically seven, which was published in the PLOS one. And this includes communication, consistency, predictability, physical attraction, positivity, enthusiasm, proximity, and shared activities and, and attunement as well. And so with this information, and now they're able to create better type of robot dogs. So my next question would be for you is, would you get a real dog or would you get a robot robot dog? And what would you do with it? For myself in particular, I like dogs. I do. I don't think I would have a dog anytime soon, maybe until after I get the motor home, then I would get it for a sense of protection. But if I was given the option, maybe I would get a robot dog because it might be a little bit more efficient. It might be easier to train for the reasons that I would use it for. It wouldn't be necessarily for merely for affection to have a best friend, but it would be for a sense of safety on my behalf. But then you do have others that just love everything about dogs, taking them out for walks, giving them cute little cuddles, having their little corks that they have, the foods that they prefer over, of, over other foods. And this is is very what's very fun about having a pet. But you need to understand what's the purpose or what do you what is that purpose to why you have an animal? Is it to prevent loneliness? Is it to have a best friend? Or is it for protection or even to have a service type animal, which now we know service animals can be anything from dogs to peacocks. I don't know if you've seen the picture of a woman who brought a peacock on an airplane because it was a service peacock. Hey, look, I, I don't I don't get it, but that's fine. There's also service pigs as well from what I saw. Also pretty cool. 
So what would you do? Would you get a real dog or would you get a service, uh, a robot dog? Hyde says, I think I like dogs more than people. Well, they are a bit more simple. That's for sure. Sever says, dogs teach people empathy to a degree anyways. Right. When you have that sense of responsibility to have to care for another being, it, it does help with attempting to create empathy, for sure. Dogs give unconditional love, says Steve. They do. Archangel says, service peacock? Seriously? Yes. You can Google it. It's there. So we have a few minutes left, and there is one more I do want to cover. But quickly, something that just came to mind. Seven, uh, Steven, Steve says, dogs give unconditional love, except chihuahuas. <laughs> they give unconditional anger. That's why I love watching videos of chihuahuas. <laughs> They're so funny. So we have a few minutes left, and there is one article that I just found so, so strange. I'm going to share my screen here, and you're going to think, what does this have to do anything with the article? Just you wait. Here's the article. This is just a, a picture that I pulled off the internet, but it leads into what we're talking about. 51-year-old Yoshido Yoda was recently arrested in Japan after being identified as the locally famous raincoat man, a mysterious thief who authorities had been trying to identify for over a decade. Yoda has worked as a newspaper delivery man, and he was apparently obsessed with a garment known as a kappa, a plastic or vinyl poncho worn over one's clothes to protect them from the rain. Upon searching his home, police found over 360 raincoats that he stole since 2009. Here is a picture of that that the Japanese police collected from this man's home. Let me go into more detail. So source from the from the Japanese police revealed that Yoda's um, had this what what it would go finding women who he saw riding bicycles or simply checking parked bicycles and he would take their raincoats while they were unattended. And if he found one, he would snatch it for his collection and then <laughs> and then take it home. Now, when I say Yoda, it is not our beloved little green Yoda. No, this is what Japanese would consider a menace to Japan because he would just steal wi women's raincoats. No one else's raincoats, just women. And he had mentioned when he was asked, why have you been stealing raincoats since 2009? You have become, you're now known as the famous raincoat man. Like, why are you doing this? And he said all female gar garments he could have stolen, he had mentioned that he got excited seeing women in raincoats as he did seeing women in lingerie. So police estimated that he had caused about $7,000 in damages over his 13-year-long crime. People are weird. It's just it's such a random thing to want raincoat that he would just take that is a criminal career right there you know it's 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 not it's not dangerous to an extent it's not really harming anyone it's just it's just bizarre so i had to cover this one with you today because it's strange and we're on we're doing strange paradigms But I will say I do really enjoy the rain. I only own one raincoat and has a little hood on top of it. And I would never leave it unattended because it's my only one that I have. So I would keep it forever. 
So out of all the articles that we covered today, which one was your favorite? And I love asking this question every single week because we cover so many. Sometimes it's hard to decide which one you preferred or your favorite one out of all of them. In my case, I really liked the star map one where it makes you have to rethink everything. But also, I can't neglect the Pukwajis in Paraguay which they're not called Pukwajis at all, but f I will forever call all types of goblins Pukwajis. And I'm going to do extensive research on these creatures because, wow, they're very cool. Archangel says the Yoda story. It's bizarre. <laughs> Hope and Glory says, don't take your rain jacket to Japan. I don't think I will. If anything, I'll buy like a really cheap one in case there's another type of raincoat man that's going to take my raincoat. <laughs> crazy tmi says the cloning article that one was pretty cool of the arctic wolf for sure and it also helped me understand how cloning actually works my question for you is and i'm making a poll now um what strange news topics would you like to see more of in these shows because what I love about this show in particular, Strange Paradigms, is that I'm able to really interact with you, the viewers and listeners, to hear your insights, to hear your input. And so I'm making a poll now. I made it, actually. And it's UFOs, Bigfoot, Paranormal, Call on Camera. These are the choices that you can pick on what you'd like to see more of on Strange Paradigms that airs every single Friday, usually at 3 p.m. PST, except for today, it was at 10 a.m. Pretty early. Unless I'm having some some coffee. Mm. I like my coffee super sugary. I actually just got this creamer. It's a cinnamon dulce latte from Starbucks. Like it's a creamer that you can buy. So good. I mean, if you put a little, if you put too little, it tastes like metal. But if you put a good amount, it tastes like cinnamon. I would like to mention, and I keep saying Strange Paradigms, but I I did change the show name. It is now Strange Weekly News or Strange News of the Week. So I will have to catch myself when I say Strange Paradigms because it is now Strange Weekly News, which we're still on the same track, just slightly different name to give the new viewers and listeners an understanding of exactly what we're talking about. Steve, thank you. It says... You have your RV name now. Pukwarji. <laughs> also, thanks for your shorts, which make me smile. <laughs> I I actually really love doing shorts, and I try to get them out every single day. I have just something that's really strange, something that made me laugh, or something that I think that my audience would enjoy. You can also catch these short videos on TikTok at Eyes on the Skies or on my instagram as well which are a part of instagram reels all of my social media links are below where you can find literally everything i create but i do all of my updates like news updates um for my shows on twitter so make sure to follow me on twitter at eyes underscore on the skies that link is below as well but we're practically done with today's show. If you want to continue this conversation, bring it to the after show chat on my Discord server. That link is also below where you can speak to almost a thousand like-minded people. And you can talk about this show or join any other chat room that I have, which is a bunch, where you can share your experiences or you can talk about any news items that you found which I do want to mention. If there's any strange news that you found during the week, please send it to me at Christina at strangeparadigms.com. Once again, that is Christina. There is no H in my name, Christina. It's Christina at strangeparadigms.com. That link is also below. If you come across any strange news, email me. Do it. I would love it. It also helps me to give you awesome content make sure to hit the notification bell if you're watching this on YouTube so that you do not miss any of the videos that I cover along with all of my YouTube shorts as well, which is almost every single day, Monday through Friday. And 
And let's take a look at the poll. And the majority of you want to see more UFO news. You got it. I'm going to bring you some more UFO news to the best of my ability. But if you come across any articles, send it to me. Also, send it through any social media link, any social media platform as well. I'll probably, probably find it. Well, that is it. Make sure to say Pakwajis at least once today in a conversation that you have with somebody. Be safe. And remember, keep your eyes on the skies. Thank you.